my spooky friends. This is John, your host of the Paranormal Podcast, Dairyland Frights, that covers everything spooky, creepy, and mysterious in the Midwest and beyond. So, boy, I, I cannot help it. I tell my spooky friends, Karen, that I'm so blessed to have so many great guests on. And I have the streak of all streaks. And you, uh, are, are, I was so happy to get you on. I can't even speak because I was like, I talked to your friend, uh, Vicky Jo Anderson. Uh, go back and listen to the podcast on sleep paralysis. She was awesome. She recommended you. And I said, Oh, yeah, I got to get Karen on. So, Karen, thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. And welcome. Well, thank you so much, John. I'm just so grateful and honored and blessed to be here with you today. And yeah, Vicki is amazing. One of my best friends. And I'm, I love when she um, puts me in contact with someone like you because it's like I get to meet someone who's already a friend. So I'm yeah. really looking forward to our conversation today. Thank you. Yeah. And we are spooky friends now. We are. <laughs> or, or friends. <laughs> <laughs> and I like that one. Awesome. Awesome. So Karen, I'm going to do a little bit, uh, kind of introduce you to the audience and everything. And then, um, you know, please, like I tell all my guests, if something's off about your bio or anything, go, no, I don't do that anymore. Or yes, you know, I'm doing this um, because I'm going to get everything correct. So when people listen to this episode, if they want to reach out to you, they have all the correct information and have all the things when we get into it, obviously about your experiences, that they know everything that's current so we're not giving them false information so what i love about karen was she has done something extremely brave okay so karen and her name is karen i should have said wilkinson is that correct Just yes that's pronounce correct. Her name karen correctly. and she, today and she's not only shared it on my show she's shared it on many podcasts so please listen to my podcast i'm selfish that way but she has also you know put her experiences out there and like i said it's very brave for her to do that because she really wants to talk today about and we'll talk about some other things not only about her life experiences with extraterrestrials but some of the motives and you know some of the activities of extraterrestrial beings and you know today we're going to kind of we're going to kind of delve like and this is getting from what karen has sent me too um, kind of delve into some of the reasons behind their actions and the challenges they encounter. Okay, anything with the government, with extraterrestrials, and I'll, I'll let you speak on this in just one second, Karen. As we know, anybody who has dealt with UFOs uh, being abducted, which Karen will talk about in her experiences, it has stemmed from the ridiculous to the frustrating to the terrifying to the almost, I don't know, uh, just unbelievable the way the government treats people. And just when Karen, like I said, is brave enough to put, and she has written this in a book too, uh, which we'll talk about, is you feel betrayed by your own government too uh, when you're just trying to find answers about this. And one of the things which I love, is something you said here and, and the intricate web of deceit they weave in their interactions with humanity and it's not only government it's other areas too which you know karen will talk about so karen i just kind of just get a brief introduction from my audience so let's talk about first thing your experience and then let's talk about your book and what you kind of wrote in there and you know it's called by the way stolen stolen seed evil harvest. So Karen, you know, I'd love to hear that. Yeah. Well, thanks again, uh, John, for your kind words. Yeah, it yeah. the book is Stolen Seed Evil Harvest. And I wrote the book um at the behest of my friend L.A. Marzuli because I had done an interview with him for his movies in the UFO series that he's done. There are ten total in that series now and I think I'm in four, six, and 10, actually, of those mm -hmm. series, if you want to see more of my information. 
And when we were doing filming for the fourth movie, um, we had just met and he didn't know my story and I didn't know much about him either, which was a great way for us to meet because we were just kind of thrown together. And um, I was extremely nervous about sharing my story. I'd never shared it with anyone. And there's such a stigma out there for anyone who's had any kind of experiences that you just automatically expect to be vilified or to be laughed at or to be shunned or turned away. And he Mm -hmm. didn't do that. Um, Mm -hmm. Honestly, I wasn't quite sure how he felt about it for a while, you know, while he was putting the information together. Um, And he was extremely supportive and kind and, and he believed me and he listened and he Mm -hmm. understood what I was talking about because he'd heard it before Um, different parts of that from different people. And so me not knowing any of that coming in, you know, providing that confirmation, it was, it was extremely helpful and cathartic Mm -hmm. and emotional and a lot of different Mm -hmm. things. But what I found when I started to share that story was people were coming out and thanking me for sharing the story. And I'm, and I was not expecting that. And they were thanking me because they didn't feel alone anymore because they'd had the same experiences or similar experiences. Mm -hmm. And so that also compelled me to write the book. And when the book came out, then I started getting correspondence from people saying, I just read my life story. These exact same things happened to me. And not only was I no longer alone, but now we're kind of creating this community of people who really realize we're not alone. This has happened to so many of us. No one is talking Mm -hmm. about all of these things, how Mm -hmm. it's a lifetime of impact, whether you've been taken once, whether you've been taken hundreds of times like I have, whether you remember whether you don't, whether you have scant memories or full memories, you know, I remember quite a bit. I don't remember everything, but I remember a lot. And, Mm. and what I do remember, people can really um, relate to. And so it's been helping people feel better about themselves and feel better about their journey and feel giving them the courage and the strength to be able to also stop the abductions if they're still happening. Because I write a lot about that. And I talk a lot about who and what they are and how to stop it. Because that's really the most important thing is that people can safely remove these entities from their lives because they're destructive. Mm -hmm. And not only is it emotionally destructive, but it's physically destructive. So this has just been such a journey for me and just affected me on so many levels and so many others. I never, never in a million years expected this, didn't expect to share Mm -hmm. this. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm grateful that there's people out there like you who want to hear and listen and believe what I'm talking about. And it's okay if everyone doesn't believe me. I don't expect that. But I know that I'm going to reach people who've experienced it and who know this has happened. And maybe some of their friends and family members who are having a hard time believing them when they hear it from someone else, they're going to be like, well, if someone else is saying the same thing, it makes more sense now. It's more mm. believable now. And it's going to help people through this. Yeah. So I know you've probably said it a million times, but can you talk about your experience with my audience? Um, I don't want to give anything away in the book. Go out and buy her book, Karen's book. Um, I know I just did, so I, I look forward to reading it. Um, so can you just tell me about your experience, you know, about what you remember? Um, that would be great. Right. Um, And I have a lifetime of memories. I didn't go through any kind of hypnosis or anything like that to remember these things. I just have the memories. And and I think I have so many of them. And and we've kind of been putting this together, talking with other people, other experiencers, that the more you disassociate, the harder it is for them to plant false memories or to Mm. kind of hypnotize you into forgetting what has happened. And that was my big trick from the time I was little was just disassociating um, Mm. from what was going on. Yeah. Being there, being aware, but allowing my brain and my mind and my heart to just find another safe place to be. Sure. Um, because I was taken from my earliest memories and my earliest memories. I don't recall a time in my life when they weren't there, terrorizing me, scaring me, showing up in the middle of the night. Mm-hmm. Um, it didn't matter where I was, whose home I was at. Um, they found me no matter where I went. Um, mm-hmm. And typically it would happen in the middle of the night. Um I would sometimes be woken by a light, sometimes Mm. by a low humming vibration, always by this feeling, this intense feeling of something evil in the room Mm. and this feeling of fear and dread. 
And being little, I would always try to hide at night before I went to bed, try to find interesting, unique places to hide. And a sibling once told me, you know, we can't hide from them. They can see us through the house. You know, and that's a conversation that these little tiny kids are having, you know, at them because we didn't have vocabulary for who they were. Mm -hmm. And I don't talk about anyone else's stories, but my own, because everyone's story is their own to tell and everyone's experiences are their own to share. So I will Uh not share names or other information about other people, except for myself or anyone who's given me permission to do so. But when I talk about siblings, yeah, you know, we would have conversations about them um, Mm -hmm. and I couldn't hide from them. And I would Mm -hmm. wake up in the middle of the night, just terrified. And there would be at least two, sometimes three, four more, um, usually two or in groups of twos of what people typically refer to as the shorter, the small gray aliens. Mm -hmm. They were short, maybe three to four feet tall. They had big bulbous heads, black screen looking Mm -hmm. eyes that didn't move. Their necks were super spindly. Their arms and legs were spindly and thin. Some of them had a very bad smell to them, sort of a dead animal, sulfur, excrement, Mm. hard to describe, chalky almost smell. And um, they would be there. They would put me into a state of waking paralysis as opposed Mm. to sleep paralysis, which I also had many times, many times with, you know, with the, that you talked with Vicki Joy Anderson about. But there's also a waking paralysis where you're awake first, you're aware of what's going on, but then suddenly you can't move, you can't speak, you can't scream out for help. And even if I was able to yell out for help, if there was someone else in the room, they would be put into a, such a state of deep sleep, I couldn't wake them up. Parents, siblings, friends, you know, spouse, anyone else in the room, I couldn't wake them up. Um, they just would be put into this deep sleep state. And um, then I would be levitated from the bed, usually, um, and up through a ceiling or through a window. And the window wasn't open. It would be closed with the ceiling, obviously, you know, and I know it sounds crazy. I remember every detail, the ceilings of these different houses and lights and things like that. And I write a lot about that in the book. But the one really unusual part of that is there's this low vibrational hum that accompanies it. You just, I would feel it my whole body. And it felt like my body was just breaking into a bazillion little pieces and Mm. it was the strangest feeling and it's so hard to describe because we don't really have anything like it but it's like this just takes over your body and changed Mm. something about my body and at Mm. that point usually I would go into some sort of a passed out state because sometimes I would remember going up sometimes I remember seeing the houses get further away or trees Mm. or things like that But usually I would wake up shortly after that at some point, who knows how long, sometimes at a bank of elevators or sometimes on an exam table, you know, with different entities around, um, doing different things every time I write about a lot of those different things in the book. But, um, and I saw just all different kinds of non-human entities and humans. And Mm -hmm. that's what bothers me the most. There were what looked like from my vantage point, humans working alongside these entities. Mm -hmm. Um, And some in like um, military type outfits, some in like lab coats, some in just like plain, like these smocks and pants kind of outfits. And and that was the part that was, you know, really hard for me is that there were other humans there that I couldn't go to for help that wouldn't help me because, you know, when I was taken, I'd also get, everyone not just me but everyone else there too you could see it with them and and yourself Mm -hmm. i was put into a state of what we call ufo brain fog and i describe it like walking and thinking through molasses everything Mm -hmm. is just that much more difficult and and we were warned not to talk to anyone else and Mm -hmm. you know not to act out or be violent or anything like that but when you i would try it's like I was restrained. Um, so it was very difficult and very, you know, just terrifying as a child to go through all that and as an adult. Yeah. Uh Oh, that's amazing. So so let me ask you this. When did you come to the realization and inspiration to write this book? Because it would have been easy for you to do Karen, just go, Nope, I'm just going to, I'm just going to push this down. I'm just going to keep it to the day I die and maybe on my deathbed, I will tell a friend, uh, whoever. 
you, you know, know what I, I, mean? I thought I would yeah. keep it till then. I didn't think I would talk about it. And because mm-hmm. I was warned not to talk about it from a very young age, when I was about five or six years old, they, mm-hmm. they, I was trying to talk. I was little. And so I can back up to why I didn't talk. And then I can go forward to why I finally did. Um, if that, if you'd like. Yeah. Okay. So I was about five or six years old and they, they took me on in this particular time out into the backyard of my grandparents' house. And there's a clothesline that separated the yard and I'm on one side of it and they're showing me what, what we call screen memory. So it's like what we have today with VR goggles. It's just so real. You, you know, it just looks and feels so real. And I was really there, but what I was seeing in front of me was my family being marched out in front of me. And they're telling me, you can't, you can't keep talking about this. You can't keep trying to tell people about this. We have told mm-hmm. you to be quiet and you're not being quiet. If you're not quiet, you're going to, your family will be killed. And they mm-hmm. showed me my family. They were, they sprayed something on the backs of their necks and then they showed them mm-hmm. being beheaded in front of me. And I was a six year old kid. I was terrified. Yeah. Five or six yeah. years old. I mean, and where do you put that? You know, and, yeah. And that's when the dissociation really began because then shortly after that, they found me huddled in the corner of a bathroom stall at school. And I was just sitting there holding on my knees, rocking back and forth. I wouldn't come out of the bathroom. They had to call my mom to come get me. She mm-hmm. coaxed me out of the bathroom. And I just kept saying, I don't want them to take me anymore. I don't want them to touch me anymore. Well, they didn't know what I was talking about. Who are they? And I didn't mm-hmm. know who they were. You know, yeah. the little ones, the gray ones, the ugly ones, mm-hmm. the scary ones, whatever. That means nothing to a parent. It could be a nightmare. It could be other kids. It could be anything. So she took me to the doctor and he looked me over and said, well, whatever's happened to her, she's young. She'll forget. She'll be okay. You know, this is in the 60s and 70s. It was clearly a different time. And they didn't have anything concrete to go on except, you know, okay. bumps and bruises, maybe some scratches and some random weird unexplainable burns and things that I did have on my body. They mm-hmm. couldn't explain. But, you know, little kids, things happen. <laughs> So right. that's yeah. when I realized no one was going to help me. There was nothing mm-hmm. I could do. I was, I felt stuck. I felt trapped. Um, I felt like I had no choice and my brain just allowed me to have this side of me that lived this normal life mm-hmm. and the side of me that dealt with and lived that part of my life. And mm-hmm. I was able to separate the two very distinctly. And I think that's why I have the memories I do and others who I've talked to who dissociated in the same way and not having like multiple personalities, but really having a protector inside me who was the one that kind of was there for the tough stuff. And then Mm -hmm. just the normal side of me that dealt with life, you know? Um, Mm -hmm. And I think that's why I was able to remember as much as I did because when they would take me, then I wasn't reacting. So they weren't, they weren't reacting to me because they had this way of just getting in your face and staring in my eyes and just, changing what I was thinking or feeling or doing. And when Mm. I dissociated, they stopped doing that as much. So, you know, Mm. it, it gave me some respite from some of it. Um, so I never thought I would talk about it. And then I had a near death experience about eight years ago, Mm. which was very significant and, and really changed the way I look at a lot of things. It brought me back to my Christian faith and my Christian walk and, it brought me it brought me the tools because of the way it happened. I went through PTSD therapy and that therapy mm-hmm. gave me the tools to be able to remember to deal with the memories sure. and share the memories without the constant panic and fear okay. and everything else because that's what comes with it. Anyone you talk right. to who's been through this will most people will be like that panic and fear is just there. And so I learned yeah. how to manage that and be able to share. And once I could, I was like, I just, God led me to, you have to share the story and led me to LA Marzulli. I didn't know who he was. I wasn't mm-hmm. really familiar with him. So I kind of familiarized myself a little bit with his work. He was, he said, told me to meet him when he was here in Texas and, and we okay. did, and it all just kind of happened. And now, you know, we're, we're great friends and I'm grateful for that because I'm grateful that he didn't really know him before who he was before that, because it allowed us all to have these friendships that have no bias, but what happened, you know, I didn't expect to do that, but I really felt led to share it. And I wasn't sure what was going to happen with it. But once I did, I was terrified because I had spent a lifetime being told, don't share this story. And I just did it. I was convinced they were going to come kill me and they did come after me quite a bit, but 
I had a much better defense system at that point because I was able to call on my Lord, my creator, my savior on Jesus and say, you can't touch me because I'm protected now. And they knew it and they respected that they couldn't, there's nothing they could do. And to watch them back off of me, watch them realize when I get this realization, you've got the same creator I do. You're not from another planet. You're another creation of the same right. God that I have. And when I realized that, and they realized that I realized that, <laughs> sorry for that confusing roundup, but that <laughs> was crazy because then they knew they no longer had any power or hold over me. And the only way they could is if they tried to trick me, which they did try to trick me into that, but they weren't able to, you know, I, definitely the, I have the higher power watching over me. Oh, um, right. But, and that was incredible. And that's when I'm like, I have to share this, you know? And so all of those pieces kind of came into place around the same time. And the near death experience kind of came after the me realizing we had the same creator. And I think it was their attempt to take me out of the game, quite honestly. Mm -hmm. And it didn't work. And that just gave me more motivation than ever to do something. I didn't think it would be this. <laughs> I didn't think I would be writing a book. I didn't think I'd be sharing with anyone. I just wanted, I didn't know what I was going to do. <laughs> I had none of this was what I thought I would do. But um, that's why, because I never thought I would, sh I would be saying, you know, sharing this information. But now I'm so grateful that I did and that I can and that I have this platform to share with others and to help others because ultimately that's really all I want to do. Um, and we are all grateful that you did. Uh, because one of the, one of the biggest things is I've never been through anything like this. Okay. Obviously if I did, I would tell you, <laughs> we'd have a good conversation. Right. Yeah. But you have I've though. been, I have, well, so I've been through other things that are deep, meaningful to me like that. Okay. So I had a good friend of mine commit suicide two years ago. Oh, okay. I'm so sorry. Yeah. And I appreciate it. Thank you. But here's the thing. I was battling with myself that I didn't do enough, right? Like, and you kind of feel like, I kind of felt to myself, I have to do something more. So I took it upon myself, not only in this podcast, to bring it up to people and say, hey, if you're going through this, like May is Mental Health Awareness Month, so I do a lot with that. And, uh, you know, I talk to, you know, I put out things, say, hey, if you're looking for help, I know these people, you know, get your therapy, whatever you need to do. And yeah. a, a lot of that had to do with, I could have just retreated, like, you could have retreated in a shell, right? You could have just sat in your home, never came out again, oh, just, you know, easily. I don't know, just detached yourself, right? And yes. you didn't. And I, and I think that should be celebrated more than vilified or people roll their eyes or whatever. And I'm not saying that everyone out there has the uh, responsibility to say this, but they also have the, re I feel they have the responsibility if it does happen, mm -hmm. not to treat it as a joke, right? Yeah. Not to try to get the clicks. And we were, uh, Karen and I were talking offline and it, we, we both feel that when someone goes on YouTube and says, oh, I was abducted by an alien and they did this, this, and this, and look, here's the proof. And you're going, come on. <laughs> I mean, does that bother you? Do, you? do you get upset with that? Or do you just want to inform people more? Yeah, I think, you know, it's I don't disparage anyone who's out there trying to share their truth. Sure. And I'm not going to judge anyone who's trying to share their truth. But what really gets to me is when it's clear that someone is just mocking others who are trying to share their truth or they're yeah. putting out something that is clearly a fallacy or a fake or just clickbait and is not actually anything. And it doesn't help anyone. It doesn't go anywhere. It's just for personal gain. I mean, you don't, you know, writing a book is not a big career move for me. It wasn't something to, you know, do, that's not why I did any of this, you know, Mm -hmm. sharing the story i had nothing to gain and pretty much everything to lose yeah. but it was important to me because once i started meeting other people who've been through it mm -hmm. i realized 
how many people are out there and potentially how many more people are out there that need to hear this and need to know that they're not alone. Like you said, when someone feels alone in a tragic situation and had this much trauma, Mm -hmm. it can go any number of ways. But Mm -hmm. unfortunately, some of those ways are down a very dark path that end in self-destruction. And I never want that for anyone. And, you know, there are suicide hotlines you can call and, and things like that to help because, you know, it's, it's, there's always an answer. There's always a light. There is always a way through, even when it doesn't seem like there is. And trust me, I have been in those very dark places because of this. Things like this take you into the deepest, darkest places you can imagine and make you question why you're here. But I have learned that, you know, and I have prayed to God, please, when I get to that point, please always just nudge me, wake me up. And he, he is faithful to that. He will, he's always, always lifted me back up every single time. He will not leave me in a fallen state. He doesn't want me to be desolate and destroyed. He wants me to glorify him and to be in a life that he's just given me beauty for ashes that I don't deserve. And none of us do. And when we think we're not worth it, you're right. We're not, we don't do anything to earn it. It's just a free gift that's given to us because there's love for us beyond measure that people don't realize is out there. And so when it feels desolate, just know there's love for you. I love you. I'm, I'm sure, John, I'm sure you feel the same way about others. And, yeah. and, and, you know, your creator loves you too. So there's just so much love for people out there. But I do know in situations like this, especially in this paranormal community and with people I've met who've been experiencers, who've been taken against their will, it is so emotionally destructive and so difficult to get through. Mm-hmm. And if I wasn't able to get the help that I needed, I wouldn't be able mm-hmm. to do this today. And yeah. So, you know, that's why I think people like Vicki and I just want to be there. You know, you can email us through our websites. We get those emails, not someone else. You know, I mean, we, we answer those. We reach out to you. We'll, we will continue those conversations. Um, and if you have reached out to me and have not heard from me, reach out again. I mean, obviously there's always technical glitches. Things get lost. Things don't go through the way they're supposed to. But if you have emailed me and want to hear from me and haven't heard from me, please don't stop trying. And um, I'll give you the email address to post in the show notes as well, because we, we have to be there for one another. Absolutely. And the other thing to, I tell people, you have to love yourself before you love anybody else. So that can mean several different things to several different people, how you do that. But just know that, again, what Karen did was you can do too, okay? And maybe it's not a book. You don't have to do a book, but maybe you just do something online or maybe you go somewhere and speak or maybe, who knows, however you want to do it. The main thing is to say, look, I I understand where you're coming from and, and let's get together and figure out a way to work together and love one another that we can get through our days. Maybe that's as simple as you're looking for. Yeah. I don't know, but that's up to you, right? Exactly. Sometimes one more day is what you need to find your mm-hmm. answer, to find the path and, and figure out what it is that you do want to do, you know, and where, where you can help and where you can share, you know, sometimes it's just volunteering to help at a conference or sometimes sure. it's, and those are the the most important people in my book, people who volunteer to help out. I always need help, you know, people that volunteer to help with with the things that we're all doing behind the scenes here and all of L.A. Marzulli's team. You know, we, you know, everything we do is just, is just through the ministry. So we're not out here raking in the big bucks. We're out here just working for free most of the time because we care about people and we care about what we do. And that's what's most important. Um, so, you know, anytime that people can give to help volunteer, whatever, there's always opportunities to be involved, to share your story, to share your skills. Um, you are important. I mean, you may not think that skill set you have is important, but I'll bet you that I know that there is someone who thinks it is. And I know that he loves you. Absolutely. So here's what everybody wants to know or at least get an idea of what is 
what do the aliens want? I mean, what's their end game? Why would someone, this, this is my, let me just throw my kooky theory out here for you. Oh, that <laughs> here. Yeah. So my thing is this, there's two different things I view. One, that they could be time travelers, that they're coming back here to do something that, to help. I don't know if that's true or not. The other thing is, back, and whether you believe this or not, this has been on government records, actually, that I believe, I can't remember if it was Roosevelt or whoever, but they met some greys, aliens. And basically, the Grays said to the government, look, we can come in here, we can just wipe you guys all out. Like, if we wanted to snap our fingers, you guys are gone. However, what we'd be willing to do, we'd be willing to share our technology if you let us experiment on your people, on humans. And supposedly what happened in that meeting was, okay, we'll share your technology. And this is how many people you can experiment on a year. And they gave the aliens a number, which, okay, I don't know, whatever. But the aliens, just like you would think they would do, said, oh, it's, I'm just going to say 250. 250 people a year you can abduct, you can experiment on. That's, that's fine. And the aliens went, yeah, sure, okay. And they went far above it and went far above what they were supposed to do. And the government was helpless to stop them. Um, I don't know if either theory is what's going on. And also, too, they were said not to breed with humans. And the aliens went, yeah, we won't do that. And then, of course, if you're so powerful, if you basically can snap your fingers and destroy an entire planet, you sure are not going, you're just going to be like, yeah, okay. Okay, yeah. sure. That sounds good. Uh, because what what is the, what can you do to them? Absolutely nothing. That's just my theory. Is but I, I would love to hear from you because again, this is just that this is the big question, right? Like, right, right. Why? And that's why I wrote the book. I try to answer a lot yeah. of those questions in the book, and the next Go book ahead. that I'm working on now will answer more of those questions too. So be looking for that one. I won't want to let the cat out of the bag. I'm just going to say okay. I'm working on it, and it, the next one is going to be you know, answering more of these questions because yeah, I think you're right on. They, time is very different for them. And what I've yeah. experienced and what I experienced with my near death experience was also that where, you know, time doesn't exist the same as it does here for us. We tend to put everything in this little box of where we live on earth and how we live. And that's great for right here, but it doesn't apply to everything else. And everything around us is so much more and so much more complicated, so much more vast. You know, time and space as they exist right here for us are one thing. But outside of that, it's something else. And time is not the same. And space is not the same. And travel is not the same. So in essence, anyone who's passed on, anyone who's created, anyone who comes into our purvey, anyone who, you know, especially non-human entities, they are of time travelers of a sort because they're traveling into our sense of time and into our space of time from theirs, which is going to be completely different. Um, and I experienced that firsthand. And when I, you know, died on the table on the operating table and was able to experience the lack of our time, um, mm. which, you know, it's an, almost impossible to describe because <laughs> until you've experienced it, you don't understand the difference that there is a difference. Mm. But, yeah. Um, so I think I agree with you there. It's just a lot more complicated than that. <laughs> you know? Okay. You're right on. You're on the target. Um, okay. The other one that you were talking about was the Griotta Treaty, and that was in the time of Eisenhower. Yeah. I opened the book because I write about that. It's actually in Chapter 1. When Eisenhower, you get this book, yeah. in Chapter 1, I go through definitions, and I go through some of the earlier things that happened that kind of set this up. You know, Roswell and the Griotta Treaty weren't the start by any means of any of this. These entities have been interfering and with humans from the moment we were created and in, in, in the Garden of Eden. Um, when you talk about the Nakash and Satan, he was a fallen angel. He was one of these non-human entities mm-hmm. interfering with people. And they have been, if you look through the histories of 
the ancient civilizations, whether it be the Greeks or you know Mesopotamia or wherever you go, and and all this, you're going to find descriptions of these entities. Mm-hmm. Yes, and you're going to find descriptions of their craft: fire in the sky, or fiery chariots, or glowing mm-hmm. um, blackness, or different things like that. However, it's described differently all over. Um, and I tried it, you know, and, and the next book will go more in detail on some of that, I think, too. But so when you talk about, but when you talked about the Griotta Treaty, and that was Eisenhower in 1954, yes, <laughs> that I think is when things kicked into high gear here in the United States, because at that point, they were looking, what happens is we're dealing with entities that are of a different realm. And mm-hmm. this is a very, as I'm sure Vicki Joy Anderson's spoke about this is a very legalistic society god's creations they have to have permission to be able to do anything think back to maybe she probably talked about the vampire lore of old where they have to have permission to cross the threshold threshold that's exactly that same kind of thing they needed permission to be able to take people randomly they were able to get permissions here and there through different cults and secret societies and people who had already been summoning them and reaching out to them as, you know, entities and things like that. But to get some sort of blanket permission, that required someone who was considered to be able to speak for the people, right? And Mm -hmm. that's what a president Mm -hmm. is considered to be able to do. So when you're in his country, then he's your ruler, basically, you know, and, Mm -hmm. and so it follows along those lines. So Whoever gave that permission, however that went down, and we'll never have all those details, although it has been confirmed that there were meetings and that that some things did come from that. However that all went down, there were permissions granted to, to experiment on humans and animals. Now, how far they took that, if there were stipulations set that weren't adhered to, if they found loopholes and whatever contracts were agreed to, you know, uh, who knows? We just don't have the information. But what we do know mm-hmm. is permissions were given. And that's why you see yeah. things like cattle mutilations, human mutilations, which nobody likes to talk about because the cattle mutilations are just so dark and scary. But it actually happens to humans, too. You just don't hear about it in the news. Um, and then abductions and then humans being impregnated. I That happened to me. And then the things that they do, these things work admitted to in a government report in 2022 yeah, yeah. by our government and the anomalous mm-hmm. acute and subacute side effects report, which I also have in the book. And they admitted to the fact that, yeah, there's the unexplained missing pregnancies and all these other things, which myself and many others I've spoken to went through and we have the proof of it. And I'm working on another project I can't talk about, but you know, we're working on trying to get more proof for those things to help people because people are like, well, I don't know if I believe you. I'm like, well, I have, you know, medical records and positive pregnancies and all this other stuff. But, yeah. you know, everyone wants to say, well, your body absorbed it or you lost the baby and you didn't know. I'm sorry. Ask any woman if she thinks she would lose a baby and not know. I yeah. think that's just ridiculous. And it's, yeah. it's sad because we mourn those losses deeply, fully, completely, and it never Absolutely. leaves us. So Absolutely. and even a father feels the same way as well, you know, so any parent yeah, who loses yeah. a child, it doesn't matter at what point you lose that child, it's devastating. But um, so, yeah, I think I agree with you that that is part of it. Um, there is a, you know, another part of it is there's, there's definitely a breeding program. And that's something that's been going on also for, from mm. as far back as our history goes. There are even some researchers saying that, you know, they think that, Eve in the garden even had a relationship with Nakash and one of the one of the first two sons was Adam's and one wasn't and I'm not an expert on that so I don't go down that road um Mm -hmm. I certainly leave that to others but there's just so much so many clues out there to where this goes but you get to Genesis 3 15 it sets up a seed war that's going on today and if you don't Mm -hmm. understand as L.A. Marzulli says if you don't understand Genesis 3 15 you're going to miss the whole gist of the Bible, because it's in there from Genesis to Revelation. These entities are in the Christian Bible from Genesis to Revelation. And they're in many other groups, um, historical and religious texts as well. And they're just everywhere. Um, so yeah. you, the proof is there. The, the seed war has been set up. And then Genesis 6 talks about how the sons of man saw the 
the sons of God, so the daughters of man, the sons of God, little g, the Bineha Elohim, which are the divine council. And some people don't share that view, but there's just so much proof to it. I can't see how you can't, but I won't disparage anyone's beliefs and I don't yeah, expect yeah. anyone to believe like I do. But right. just didn't answer your question that, you know, that they saw the daughters of man were beautiful and took up them wives of all they choose they chose. And then they were, they gave birth to giants, the mighty men of old, the Gibberim, the, the, there's so many different cultures <coughs> that have this same story. Excuse me, allergies. Um, that you know set this up, and it's going on today. I believe yeah. after, and I write about this in the book too. So for more information, I know I'm skimming the surface, but I do provide a lot yeah, more information yeah. in the book. After the flood of Noah, there's some massive changes happened, and they've been trying to get back to that place of being able to breed since then because if they can corrupt the human bloodline enough then they can have control over this earth that they want back because they were here before we were and you look at all this old ancient architecture the pyramids the giant mm. buildings the things we can't build today even and we can't explain it's because it was here before because we didn't mm. build those things you know we call this ancient in ancient angel architecture or ancient Nephilim architecture or whatever you want to call it. But these things were here before and they right. want it back. They love this planet. They love this earth. You know, they want it back from us, but we were given the birthright when God created Adam and Eve. And when he put Adam in the garden, Adam got the birthright to the earth because the angels yeah. that sinned and fell, they were all here before, but you know, they lost their, they lost out and they wanted it back and they don't get to have it. We have it, but if they can get enough of them and if they can lead enough people away from the truth and, you know, there's mm -hmm. so many different reasons that I outline in the book, why they're doing what they're doing and what yeah. makes sense based on what we've seen, what we've experienced and what we've, you know, been through it, you know, but they, they won't succeed. We know that. But yeah, we do have to be ever vigilant to just help ourselves and help others who are experiencing these terrible things. So, okay. So now there's the flip side, Karen, where people have said, well, they're just our benevolent space brothers and they, and they wish to help us. And they're, yeah. they're willing to work with us because there has been stories. And like we said, we're not going to disparage anybody. Where people have been told by aliens, your planet is, you know, is falling apart. You're you're killing each other. You're doing all this. We're here to help you. Yeah. Now, I can see two sides of the coin. One is you want to build somebody up and then so you can get in, right? So a lot of people who are, you know, evil, I, I guess, uh, is just a generic term I want to start there or a little shady, what's the first thing they'll tell you? You're beautiful, yes. you're a wonderful person, and you're like, well, thank you, and they build you up, build you up. And then, right, they'll come in and yeah. be like, okay, so this is what I need from you. And you're like, well, yeah, yeah of sure. course I'm going to do yeah, that now. Give me a check for $200, I'll be able to unlock yeah, right. $200,000 yeah. for you. Yeah, yeah. Sure. yeah. There you go. And, Again, I don't want to disparage anyone if someone goes out and because there's some great people out there who might just, you know, you're at work and I don't know, you're like, man, I could use 500 bucks to pay this off. And someone goes, you know what? No problem. I can help you with that. And you're like, no, that's OK. And you're like, look, I want to help you. There are people out like that who are very generous people who are willing to help people out there and, and do what they can to make a life change. So what do you tell those people? Or how do you respond when someone goes, how do you know they're not trying to help us? Maybe they're studying us to figure out diseases, our structure of our body, so they can well, help us and go, hey, this is how you can live a longer life. Right. You can be immortal. Right. <laughs> right? Right. Well, and yeah, and that's, those are all good points. And I get these questions a lot. And I speak with a lot of people who start out with that thought process. And there are a lot of people out there saying, these are benevolent space brothers. There are also a lot of people out there saying, hey, join this pyramid scheme. Look, I'm on the top. I'm making lots of money. <laughs> yeah, right, you know, right, you have right. to be careful who you listen to. There are a lot of people out there claiming to be experts who have had no experiences personally whatsoever, but somehow they're an expert. I mean, someone like L.A. Marzulli is different. He's put in the 100,000 hours in the 
d- decades of years of research and time mm-hmm. with people and talking with people. But then there are other people who just pop up on the scene, take other people's work and decide they're experts. And, and then they, people are listening to them as if they know what they're talking about. And that's a scary thing because they're going to be, you know, some of them are saying mm-hmm. these are benevolent space brothers. Now I'm not disparaging anyone who's had these experiences and who's sharing them and who feel that way. But what I can say to you is this, how would you feel if someone kidnapped your five-year-old child? Or what would happen to you if you kidnapped your neighbor's five-year-old child or any five-year-old yeah. child? Yeah. Or raped a woman or a man or Mm -hmm. killed a fetus in someone's uterus or stole a fetus from someone's uterus or went and took Mm -hmm. a poor cow or a cat or dog or a goat or any other animal and mutilated them and left them in the farmer's field for dead. None of those are the actions of a benevolent person or a benevolent being. And if your children are misbehaving, let's say they're destroying their room maybe let's say yeah. that as, as opposed to the earth and us they're destroying the carpet in their room mm-hmm. as the more intelligent experienced person in that scenario the adult sits the child down and explains look you know this is what's going to happen if you destroy this if you don't have this if you do this so let's here's a way that we can still you can still play but we're going to do paints outside from you on or you can still play but we're not going to play with anything sharp because you could hurt yourself badly you know Mm -hmm. if they wanted to help us then they could sit down with our world leaders and share that information or with people who could you know look at an influencer maybe someone who can get that information out there sit down with all the major broadcasting centers at once you know if there's someone standing in the way of it you can certainly find a way around if you're more intelligent Mm -hmm. and advanced than we are which we know that they are and that's the other thing, you know, someone more intelligent, more advanced. And like you said, when, if you're walking down the street, rapists don't wear t-shirts that say, hi, I'm a rapist <laughs> yeah, or right. pedophiles or carjackers or Correct. bank robbers. They don't advertise what they do. They make you feel confident and comfortable with them before they take advantage of you. They say the things that you want to hear. It is all about, you know, just creating a false sense of, of um calm and creating this thinking that they're benevolent when they're not you know george adamski first penned the benevolent space brothers um term in the 1950s and he was being sarcastic as well and Hmm. you know they they have not shown that they are but what we do know is that for me i know these entities to be the fallen angels of the bible period that is what they are i have been in their presence i have had experiences with them and i realized we had the same creator that confirmed that a hundred percent but what i do know is there are also good angelic beings out there too right right the problem is because just like we talked about you can't tell the good from the bad because the bad mm-hmm. guys aren't going to tell you they're the bad guys they mm-hmm. want something from you i've had angelic experiences with good angelic entities they didn't take anything from me they helped me through a very difficult situation and then they were gone Hmm. but the bad ones they've taken and taken and taken from me until i wanted to take my own life practically and that's not okay so um i do not get on board with the benevolent space brothers i understand that many people are getting that message so if you dig down far enough if you talk to them long enough i have yet Mm -hmm. to meet one that hasn't been able to come back around to the point that yeah. none of it is actually benevolent. Yeah. And that that is interesting to me because I think a lot of people would play devil's advocate. They would mm-hmm. say, one of my favorites, I'm a nerd, by the way, if you haven't already figured that out. Um, so one of the, my favorite sci-fi movies is The Day the Earth Stood Still, made in the 1950s. Basically, the movie was designed, believe it or not, it was about the Red Scare. So it was, it was designed to tell people communism is coming and, you know, but they hid it behind an alien. But one of the things in that movie I think was absolutely fascinating was there's a part in the movie where the alien is saying, okay, I'm going to get, like you were talking about, a benevolent alien would get the UN together. And, talk, and he's trying to do that. Mm-hmm. And he's talking to the uh, Secretary of State of the United States. And they're reading these telegrams. It's the 1950s people, so 
I mean, you don't know what a telegram is? Google it. <laughs> it so anyway, um, going through all these telegrams and like the president of Paris is saying, we will not meet with the alien if he uh, comes to Paris, unless he comes to Paris. We And then the leaders of Russia, we will not meet with the alien unless he comes to Russia. And this alien is going, oh my God, what are you, a bunch of children? Like, I'm, I'm trying to help you. I'm trying to, trying to work with you. Now, mm-hmm. again, it's a movie. But what if there was an alien? And again, I'm just trying to be counterpoint here. What if there was an alien who has come down to try to do that? And there are stories about that, where aliens have come down and have talked to leaders of the Pentagon and leaders of the government and have said, hey, I want to talk. I want to come out and, and tell people we're here. We're among you. We don't mean you any harm. And Obviously, the leaders went, no, you're not. You're absolutely not doing that. And we're going to disavow any information that's out there. Um, do you have any feelings about that? You know, oh, definitely way? have some feelings about okay, that. Go yeah. ahead. First of all, there's no way they could stop them if they wanted to get that information that's out there. That's true. They absolutely can get whatever information they want out whenever they want. The only reason it's not out there is because they don't want it out there and they're stopping the powers that be from sharing information and the powers that be, are, you know, uh, whoever is running whatever governments are only going to share what they want to share for security mm-hmm. reasons or because, you know, the information is power and what have you. Yeah. So now, because if they want to share that information, they can share it. Their abilities just far outstrip our own. I mean, we are like children playing in a sandbox compared to what they can yeah. do. Um, what I've experienced, what I've seen firsthand alone is just the tip of the iceberg. So mm-hmm. if they wanted to talk to all the world leaders at once, they could make them stop in their tracks and be forced to listen. That's all it would take, you know? So I don't believe that that, would be a realistic scenario um, for what was happening in that movie. Do I think leaders would react that way? Yeah, sure. I do think the leaders would react that way. But do I think that that would stop them from sharing whatever Mm -hmm. would help? No. And then for me, I don't put God in a box. If God wants something to happen, it's going to happen, period. I mean, Mm -hmm. you know, if he wants to part the sea he parts the sea people can say well that was a weather anomaly i'm like yeah well who right. created the weather anomaly you know what i mean it's so if if it's gonna happen it's gonna happen i'm not a fatalist i'm not a um anything like that i just have faith so yeah. um i don't you know i just i don't put anything past these entities but i also know that whatever god wants to happen ultimately in the end that's what's going to happen and I've experienced yeah, miracles in my own life that no one can explain. So yeah. I am, you know, and that's not why I have faith, but it's because yeah. I have faith that I've experienced those miracles. And I just, I won't stop believing in that because it is, that is, that is everything to me. God is everything to me. Absolutely. So, but then here's this. How do you feel about the recent UFO revelations in the press? There's been stories, obviously, pictures and everything. Mm-hmm. And then finding the government spent, I think, over $20 million in three or yep. four years putting together all these reporting. And, like, how do you feel about that? That must be mm-hmm. frustrating. And I don't know. You tell me. What are you feeling? You know, some of it is frustrating. Some of it I'm grateful for because it is shining a brighter light on it. And it's for those of us who've been through it, oh, some of these reports verify and validate what we have been saying for years. And people are like, there's no way. And now we have all these government reports saying, yeah, we know that's true. Mm. But then Mm. what the part about it, that's the most frustrating to me is that they're coming out saying, yes, these things exist. Yes. We're aware of them. Yes. We're pouring billions of dollars into these programs, but no one's paying any attention to it. You know, it comes out on the news and it's crickets. That's it. Right. And then the next day everyone's back to uh, what's what's the latest, you know, pop star doing in her video yeah, exactly. or whatever. You. And so the world, everyone's looking down at their phone and no one is paying attention to what's going on around them. And they're counting on that because when we're not paying attention to what's going on around us, we're missing it. 
And there's a mm-hmm. lot going on around us. And even though we have these amazing devices that can catch video, capture video, and that's why there is so mm-hmm. much disclosure now because we are sharing, unlike mm-hmm. we've ever been able to share before, that also can be controlled like never before at the same time. Yes. And, and they're letting out just enough so that when they are forced at some point, to have to share the truth and people are going to be like, why didn't you tell us, you know, and those of us who've experienced going, see, I told you, um, they're going to say, well, it was, we did tell you, but we couldn't tell you everything because of national security and we didn't want to upset anyone. So right now they're boiling the frog, you know, it's getting to that point where there's so much information coming out. There's no doubt in anyone's mind that they exist. More people believe in extraterrestrials than believe in God. And I can't quote where that came from, but it was a, I think it was a Time Magazine yeah. poll. Right. I mean, like three to one? Come on. Yeah, come on. You know, uh, and they haven't seen them. These are people yeah. who haven't seen them versus those of us yeah. who have not experienced them. Right. So, right. You know, it, uh, well, that, yeah, that, that's amazing. So, but there are things out there, physical things, um, like in New Mexico, I don't know if you're familiar with the Dolce base. Yeah. at all um yes. and i don't know if you uh greg valdez who, who wrote a story about this is uh oh, excuse me gabe valdez excuse me what's his back name in 19 uh, gabe valdez um he wrote a book about dolce based on his experience when he uh the alien base is supposedly in New Mexico, where the uh, government, again, because of the treaty that we talked about with Eisenhower, said, okay, we need to put this base together. And there have been people who have come out and said there's numerous levels to this base. There's all these aliens and and certain people can get to certain levels. Um, and if you get to the utmost level, that's basically like you talked about where the evil aliens are, the really nasty ones who have been doing very terrible things that the government has kept basically, you know, under wraps as best as they could, but it's getting out more and more. And yeah. And the gentleman we're talking about who wrote this book, he was a police officer and he got into a, fight with one of the aliens and he to this day has this scar uh on his body i believe he has passed long since but he Mm -hmm. was patrolling he came upon the base the aliens were um, at that time either they were trying to abduct someone or they were trying to do something that you know he eventually got involved into the fight and was injured severely and went to the government to say hey your aliens are not playing nice out there. Like you have said, they're doing some terrible things and, you know, no one really believed him. And he was, you know, shunned and he, you know, and to the day he died, he kept on this story and some people believed him, some people don't. But there is a base in New Mexico called the Dolce Base that you can't, like Area 51, you get near it, you will get killed. You you cannot go near that bank. You will get killed. Like they have the signs up. Surprised. You know, trespassers will be shot. <laughs> Basically, we can well, use lethal force. And wow. right? Why isn't well, anybody not to get off the well, subject here of your book or anything? But why hasn't anyone just said, "Look, you got to open this space because right. Area Fifty One yeah. has been exposed." Because yeah. yeah. we don't have yeah. that kind of power. I mean, we can't do mm. anything that they don't want to allow us to do. We think we live in this relative peace and freedom, but that's a subjective term. You know, we sure, have the sure. freedom to yeah go to the grocery store and buy whatever it is we want to buy tomorrow, provided it's on the shelf. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, and to go where we want, provided we're legally allowed to. So right. our freedoms are very conditional and mm-hmm. and based on someone else's choices, not necessarily our own. So. You know, it's like the cat that was happy with the skim milk until he tasted the cream. We think we're having the cream right now, but we probably are still just, you know, sipping on skim milk mixed with water. And Mm. it's the best that we're probably going to get compared to most countries. And I'm very grateful for the freedoms we do have. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. 
But when I was taken, I was taken into underground bases. I was taken underground. We went in these elevators mm. that just went down and down and down. And then I got on mm. these, when I was little, I called them the sideways elevators because they went side to side or up at an angle or down at an angle and crazy mm. turns really fast. And they were silent. But uh, all I had to compare it to was an elevator because cars weren't silent then, you know, when I was little. Mm. And then I since realized that must have been some sort of high speed tram, tram or transport system. But I was underground. There were other people, other entities. And these underground places I was taken are massive beyond what you can imagine. I mean, as massive as just being topside up here. It, there's no difference. It's huge. Um, labyrinths of tunnels. And while I've yeah heard of Dulce Base, and I'll have to look up the um, Valdez, I I don't think it's limited to there. I think it's probably everywhere because sure. we don't know anything about what's under our feet. We know what we're told in no. school, which is basically whatever <laughs> right. we're fed yes. and may not have any basis in truth. We haven't dug more than, what, six miles that our scientists have given us information, and who knows how true that is. But we're mm. learning about the depths of the ocean where you could fit, what, 20 Empire State Buildings in just one little trench that's not even the deep one, you know. Right. Think how deep that is. We know nothing about what is actually under Absolutely. our feet. But what I yeah. do know is that I spent a great part of my life down and up, and it was huge. The what little part I saw of it, who knows how much more there is and where it is. But you know, I think I think it's a lot more than we have could ever imagine. Yeah, and I think that their limitations are being in our sunlight. And I, I posit that in the book that I think one of the things that probably changed during the days of Noah was that, you know, they didn't see rain before that. We know we have no record or count of rain before that flood. And with that came atmospheric changes that I think changed their ability to be in our atmosphere without certain protections. And so the underground is a perfect place for them to hang out while they figure out how to maybe interbreed just enough to be able to be up here or maybe to make enough protections up here where they're indoors enough. They don't have to be outside, you know, different things like that. So, or change our atmosphere. You know, why, why is our atmosphere changing? Are we experiencing global warming or are we experiencing global cooling? Mm. Or are we just in a cyclical earth cycle, which happens about every 12,000 years, if you look it up, you know, so many questions that we don't have answers yeah. to. But Absolutely. so much of it makes sense when you start right? looking at what we're dealing with and why. And there's so much more that you and I could talk about because I love this conversation and where it's going. And I think we could talk for two more hours, but I know we're getting close yep. to the end of our time. So I will wrap yeah, it up. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Now, l before we wrap up here, let me let me ask you this. Let's get back to the book here. Okay. Uh, by the way, you know, like I said, all my spooky friends, I will put... Uh, Karen's book and all her links in the show notes as well all my social media so please go out there and and, and uh, you know do your best to you know get her book and, and support Karen and uh, you know especially people like her so like we talked about which we'll get here in a sec but your book and excuse me I'm a mush mouth I admit it so if I mispronounce please step in your book includes some definitions uh mm -hmm. there's two terms out here I've never heard of I've never heard okay. of that really stood out to me uh ectogenesis mm -hmm. and pansumeria can you share what they yeah. mean yeah can you explain what that means and tie into the abduction phenomenon <laughs> Oh, absolutely. Yeah, those are good ones. And I have a whole section in the beginning of the book with all these definitions because there's so much right. connected to this that isn't really shared often. And those are two of the terms. Panspermia is relates to the fact that we were seeded by maybe something that came off an asteroid and went through the primordial goo and ended up being a human or by our benevolent space brothers who came down and took the apes and then said, let's make them more intelligent and turned us into humans and that kind of thing. And so that mm. is the, is the theory that we didn't come from a benevolent creator from God, but mm. that someone else came in and kind of nudged us along and created us and that they're the creator. But the interesting part about that is when you start talking to someone about panspermia, and you're like, okay, so we weren't, we don't have a creator, but well, we had a 
someone who assisted us, but we were already here before. Right. Right. Okay. Well then who created us? Oh, well, mm-hmm. they created us in that first state too. Okay. Well, who created them? Mm-hmm. You know, it always goes back to God. You can't, right. you can't not get back to that original, in my opinion, benevolent one creator. So, um, panspermia is really, is something that people like to throw around a lot in the field of ufology when they talk about our benevolent space brothers saying, yeah, there are ancestral cedars just here to help us evolve further. Um, and we all know anyone who has done any reading or anything in their life that the theory of evolution has been blatantly disregarded for and um, disproven <laughs> many decades ago. So, um, and then the other one you asked about was um, ectogenesis, right? Yes. Ectogenesis, yep. Ectogenesis is the ability to bring a fetus to maturity outside of a human womb. We have that ability today. If you Google it, you will see the artificial wombs that have been created that are actually, you know, doing wonders for premature children who are born and things like that. But this is something that I actually saw many, many decades ago when I was taken and when these fetuses were taken from my uterus because they were put into artificial wombs to bring them to fruition. It's what we think they're using the blood from the cattle mutilations for. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know if your listeners know this or watchers, but cattle, bovine blood, just like bovine milk can be used for humans in the place of human blood, just the way we use bovine milk in place of human milk for our children and ourselves, even though it's not the most healthy choice necessarily. Um, And, um, but that's another thing I won't go down because I love a big glass of chocolate milk or a bowl of ice cream as much as the next person. So, you know, (laughs) Hey, thank you God for cows. But um, anyway, um, so yeah, that's, um, that's another interesting reason why I think that we see the cattle mutilations that we do when these cattle are mutilated, they're drained of blood mm-hmm. and other animals as well. And I, we think that's what they're using the blood for. Yeah. So here's, uh, yeah. I know it's it wild is. stuff. The deeper uh, you get so, into it, the more it just all comes back and, together. Yeah. Um, so here's the big question. I, a couple more quick questions, but mm-hmm. Do you think, Karen, there will ever be full UFO disclosure? No, I really don't. I don't either. It will never, it would never benefit anyone enough to share the truth about all of it. And honestly, there are just too many peoples with their hands in it that it would look very bad if it came out. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's similar to the, uh, maybe this is kind of a, but I'll just say it anyway. Like the JFK assassination that happened back in right. I believe sixty nine. Right. Uh, how many theories? 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 Why doesn't someone just come out and be like, "The mafia right. we all did know it"? What happened? Why won't they? Yeah. Admit it? Right. Because what? they're gonna look bad when they say, "Yeah, we did it." You know. Yeah. Would people like you said? We just told people, okay, just a couple years ago, whatever, that there are aliens. We have proof, and people went, "We have the uh-huh. body." Yeah, the crap. Uh huh. Uh huh. Yeah. <laughs> and they're like, right. "Okay, that's great. Yeah. Thanks. I got. Uh, I'll, I'll get uh, back to you. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, did you hold see it, this video? It. It's so funny. You know. <laughs> yeah. Like, look at the look at the kitty. Look at yeah. the kitten. Look at the kitten. Look at the cat. It wants a cheeseburger. I'm like, oh come on. <laughs> they just told us they've got the non-human biologics in the ships, and you yes, nobody cares. I'm like, nobody cares. My whole right. life has been validated. By yes. us, all people, our own government, and nobody cares. Yeah, that's yeah. they've been boiling the frog too long. Everyone's just like, ah, oh, fine, whatever. Yeah, we all know, whatever. And yeah, and, and it's it's <laughs> with everything, right? It's with mm-hmm. if you would go and, and see some terrible, awful things, just open your laptop, Google it. Whatever mm-hmm. you're thinking, oh, yeah. you know, people being beheaded. Oh, okay, there you go. Oh, mm-hmm. you know, there's people dying in a fiery car wreck. Oh, here you go. Mm-hmm. So after a while, just uh, yeah. every day. You come to it. it yeah. And, and you and I, you know, uh, we don't have to stay at our ages, but we get it. We, we're, in the, we're in the realm where there wasn't, you know, every day. It was like, yeah. 
We had three it, it, channels. It, it, you know, yeah, and then, right? you, then like 13 and you were like yeah. sometimes fuzzy, it, but you'd get an extra picture in there. But and yeah. we didn't watch it. You know, no. we went outside. We built forts. We made mud pies. Yes. We <laughs> walks. We explored. We did things, you know. Use our imagination, yeah. people. Nothing wrong with that. Um, Kids, we played from dusk till you know, from to, dawn till dusk. We were to the to the street lights came on, right? Yeah. Or yeah. your mom or dad or whoever called you in. Yeah. At, you know, so you heard that one time. special whistle that was your family's <laughs> signal to come in, and you knew you better right. get your butt home. And yeah. that's just how it was, you know. But it's different today, yeah. and but it's Absolutely. and it's unfortunate. But we've been, yeah. But then still, yeah. with all of that said. And people will believe the craziest things, but still, still today, there are just a large, huge number of people who don't believe what I'm talking about. Don't believe me. Yes. And I think it's because they don't want to, because if they believe what I'm saying, then it makes kind of a lot of the nightmares true. Absolutely. And it makes some of the things that maybe have happened to them true. And if you, 100% if you admit that I'm telling and the truth, we're not only talking about because I've talked to um, mediums and also talking to paranormal investigators and you know people you know like Vicky written books on sleep paralysis. There are literally, in my opinion, thousands of stories out there that people are never going to tell you, never going to talk about it because oh, yeah. it's the stigma attached to it. It's it's right. it's coming out and, and putting yourself out there um, right. that is scary, right? And I don't talk um, about the darkest parts of what happened to me because that's yeah. not going to help anyone. No, I mean what I talk about is is enough, and it's it's not super scary, but it it is scary for some people. I do have a lot of good things and a lot of light things in the book. A lot of positive in there because i had to balance it otherwise it would have been so dark but mm. it's still not recommended for children you know I'm, i always say you know kind of 13 and above at least but i don't share the darkest parts yeah. a there's too much of that out there already yeah and that's not going to help anyone and no. then that brings a whole different type of person into the fray who aren't there right. for the right reasons but we're just fascinated with the darkness and and that's not what i'm about and that's not why i'm doing this so i've had some interviews where they're like just really trying to pull at these really dark threads of what happened to me and i and i won't go there because it doesn't do anyone any good i'm not gonna do anyone good you know it's not Um, not helping it so yeah so anyone who's listening to this who's had an experience Mm -hmm. you know obviously Get your book, read the book, not, you know, I'm not telling you have to, but I think it will help. Mm -hmm. Uh, But what advice would you give them, Karen? You know, the first thing would be find whatever kind of emotional support help that you need. For me, you know, God is my number one emotional support. Um, Mm -hmm. Find a place for yourself in this world, in this universe. For me, that's my faith. And I highly recommend that. It's the number one thing I can recommend. Um, know that you're not alone mm-hmm. and that there are a lot of people, not just me, that you can reach out to. There are a lot of different yeah. groups. There are a lot of people out there. Find that someone or a group that you feel comfortable with and that you feel good about. Reach out to me. Reach out to Vicky. You know, go to L.A. Marzulli's website. Go to mine. Go to Vicky's. Um, you'll have all that. You know, start start somewhere. And don't give up because just like me, you can come out on the other side of it. And if you want to do something good with it, there's always something. There's always something you can do to bring good from from it. God will always give you beauty for ashes. Yeah. Always. Um, that That's beautiful. I, I absolutely love that. That's amazing. Um so wrapping up here, thank you, Karen, for going overtime with me. Uh, I, I could talk to you for hours. Like you said, we could go two or three hours. I haven't brought up too. Hollow Earth. Yeah, I haven't oh, brought yeah. up Men in Black. I haven't bet. Uh, oh my gosh. Anyway, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so many roads we can go down. Let's do part two. Uh, Let's get it on the calendar. Yeah, and I 
definitely want to have you back on because uh, you're just been amazing and brave and really inspiring. I think uh, not only for me, but I think once people hear this, you'll be inspiring to them to hopefully, you know, get get their words up. But what do you have coming up that you can share with my spooky friends that they can uh, look forward to? Well, I am working on a second book, but I can't say when that'll be okay. out. You'll never know. All right. Um, this year, um, there are a couple things in the works right now that may be, um, I'm not sure about November yet. So I won't talk about that one until I know for sure. I know in December I will be in Branson, Missouri, the Prophecy Watchers Conference. So look for me mm-hmm. there. Um, January, I'm going to be out of pocket. Um, supposed to have a surgery then. So sorry about that, everyone. But, um, I don't, so I don't have any other, um, big speaking engagements coming up for the rest of the year. Oh, wait, I do have one, but it's probably going to happen before this comes out in September of uh, 2024 in San Antonio, Texas. And that's a, a smaller event where I'm going to, it's going to be a, a really kind of inclusive with a small audience of people where we just get to really do a lot of questions and answers and talk a lot, but there will be a podcast following that. So look for that. And then I post all of that on my social media. So if I'm going to be somewhere, if I'm going to be speaking or if I'm just going to be there with Ellie Marzulli and be at the book table, um, I do post those on my social media. So follow there. But if you want to get in touch with me, go to the website, Karen Wilkinson author, and I'll give you that as well because Sometimes things get lost in those social media messages. Right. I would rather hear from you through email. That way I'll know I'll get it. Um, and like I said in the beginning of the show, if you've reached out to me and haven't heard from me, please reach out again. Probably means something happened and I never got your message. I know that that happens from time to time. I've had that happen a few times and that's disappointing for me. So I don't want to miss anyone's anyone's messages. So please feel free to reach out. I love hearing from people. We are not alone in this. There are a lot of us. A lot of us have gone through the same things. And you would not believe how many people have had a similar experience to mine. Yeah, yeah. So, again, I am very, very fortunate to have guests on like Karen and then for Vicky, too, to be on there, to share their story, to be brave enough to, you know, write a book about it, to come out and, and not be afraid of, whether people believe them or not, but to get a message out there of hope and love. And that is so important, not only in today's world, but to a lot of people out there who are struggling. So please reach out to Karen. Uh, Like she said, sometimes things get lost. Go to her website, which will be posted in the show notes when this comes out, as well as on all my social media. And Karen, again, like I said, I, Thank you so much for blessing me today with you. Aww, uh, you're this, is John. Why, Thank this, is, this is why I do this because I can always look back when I'm like trying to do all the hard things after this editing. <laughs> <laughs> That's yes, a fun oh, thing. The work. Yeah, the work starts this after is fun. the interview ends. Yes. <laughs> So sure. again, thank you so much, Karen. I definitely want to have you back on. We can we can talk about that uh, sometime, you know, because yeah. so much uh, stuff to talk about. And oh, yeah. I'm going to bug Vicky too because I told Vicky I want to have her yes. back on too because we oh, didn't get to a lot her. of different She's things. She's amazing. Too. Yes, got to have and, All and right. have us on together because we love to to get yeah. on these interviews together because a lot of what we do really crosses over. And so for us to be talking about these things together is really fun. And we just enjoy kind mouth. of that round table feel where we get to talk about a lot of things and, and, you know, people have a lot of questions when we get together like that. So it's a lot of fun. You read my mind. Cause that's exactly mm-hmm. what I'm thinking on doing. All right. Uh, having a live discussion and having people on, and if not do it live, just do it and, and put it out there and then have mm-hmm. maybe some people reach out. But Love we'll it. talk about that later. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, thanks, thank you Karen, so, much. so much. You have a great day. And we'll thank talk you, later. everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>